everyone, and welcome to the 92nd episode of the Veritas Fact-Finding Series. And today, my special guest, Brian Scudamore uh, from 1-800-GOT-JUNK, although there's lots more in store besides that. Good morning, Brian. Good morning, Anthony. When you Now, I got to say, when you said 92nd, I, I didn't realize right away that you meant 92. I thought you meant like 90 seconds. And I'm like, whoa, this is short. <laughs> no, no, no. We got, we're we're going to go here. Uh, we're going to drag as much out of you as we can in the next 30 good. to 40 minutes. How's that? I love it. It's a good deal. Me too. Um, surfacing facts and revealing truths is a never-ending quest for us at Veritas. In each episode of our fact-finding series, we go on the ground to speak with industry professionals in an unscripted, candid, live video format to discover how we can make better investment decisions. In this series, and with everything we do, we believe the facts empower investors and that better information leads to better investment decisions. By way of background, my name is Anthony Shilapati. I'm the president and CEO of Veritas, which is an independent equity research firm based in Toronto, Canada, and I'm proud to say celebrating now 22 years being 100% employee owned and operated. Quick disclaimer, this broadcast is not to be taken as investment advice and participants or employees of the Veritas group of companies may own securities discussed in this broadcast. And while we love all our guests and Brian in particular, this session may contain forward-looking statements, investment opinions, and comments that we may or may not agree with at all. Now, I want to tell you just a small amount about Brian. And I could go on for a long time, but I'm going to let Brian do it. I'm going to start by saying anyone that's on the call, I'm a serial entrepreneur from when I was eight years old um, with hockey cards and newspapers. Um, and... When I picked up, he, Brian was kind enough uh, to send me his two books, um, WTF, sorry, which you can think about what it means, but it's actually willing to fail, and BYOB, not to be mistaking with build your own business, of course. So I started with this book because I wanted to learn a little bit more about Brian, and that's what I do with all my guests is I'll read their book or whatever they're, they've recently authored. And I couldn't put it down. And I encourage everyone on the call that's thinking about starting their own business to take them to take the 90 minutes that's required uh, and just pick up this book and uh, and read it. And I think what's most interest, interesting to me and stands out, and I'm going to touch on a number of things throughout the presentation discussion today, is how Brian sees himself as the underdog and always scrappy, always looking to get and, and, make, and, and make people wake up to things. Um, he's taken the road less traveled. At 19 years old, he pioneered an industry of junk removal. I mean, who would have thought that junk removal could be a billion dollar enterprise? Then he turned um, a, chore, a chore, people that, that hate, uh, into exceptional customer service. He scaled that success into two more home service brands, Wow, One Day Painting, and Shack Shine. Um, and I know he has, I think, one other business that he can tell us about that's, that's budding as well, something about You Move Me. <laughs> and um, I love the name of the, of the overriding uh, corporate company, which is called Ordinary to Exceptional. Brian, I'm going to start off by asking you um, to tell us about yourself in your own words, in a sense, mm -hmm. What brought you to where you are today? Why do you take the time to read, to write books? Why do you do what you do? Well, I love entrepreneurship. I love nothing more than watching people grow. When I look around and I see someone start in our call center, an hourly wage, uh, a job that they didn't expect would lead to a career, and they end up starting a business with us, that's, that's magic. And it happens all the time. We get people starting in the trucks with the 1-800-GOT-JUNK, like Josh and Tyler in Kansas City, who now have over $100 million worth of revenue annually with 1-800-GOT-JUNK because they're building teams of people that they also see they want to grow. So I love entrepreneurship. I think I've got the best job in the world. It never feels like a job, in fact. You asked, why, why did I write a book? And a bit about me. I am as ADD as they come. I am someone that sees squirrels fly across the computer, like there's always a new shiny object and I have a hard time focusing. Well, I find with three companies building different brands with great people, I get to 
live the dream of always doing something different. There's always a new challenge. Uh, I get to fail and make mistakes like the first book, WTF, Willing to Fail. I make mistakes, but they're all gifts. I get to learn from them and they make us better. And then when I think of why I wrote the book, my co-author, uh, Roy H. Williams, the wizard of ads, he writes all our radio creative, an incredible man, great friend and mentor. And he sat me down years ago when I'd go visit him every year in Austin, Texas at his academy. He said, Brian, you got to write a book. Every year, Brian, you got to write a book. And finally, I said, Roy, I, I don't want to write a book. You've been asking me for eight years. I'm not a great reader. I, uh, I'm so ADD, like you expect me to write a book. I can write. And he said, listen, we're going to make it easy. This isn't about you. This isn't about you wanting to write a book. You need to write a book for other people that you can share your ideas with. If you're about inspiring entrepreneurship and inspiring big possibilities in others, you need to write a book. And uh, so we recorded for 10 hours and got the initial level of content and conversation and it's turned into what it is today. And people like you, I'm very grateful. They read the book in one sitting, which was as you and I spoke before getting on camera, that's what the book is about. It's not meant to sit on your nightstand unread. It's meant to be digest in one sitting and uh, hopefully you take a nugget or two out of it, which people seem to do. All right, let's talk specifically about the 1-800-GOT-JUNK. And I, and I know that your road to 1-800-GOT-JUNK, uh, as you talk about in your book, you know, you, you mentioned about your dad and your grandparents and your stepdad and uh, living in, you, you know, you're living in Vancouver today, but originally from Cal California. Mm. Uh, and uh, you lived in England. So there's a, there's, a, there's a lot to your upbringing because, you know, none of us are where we are today, but for where we've already been. Of course. And I, I look at your background as you explain it in your book. And, and I see someone that's scrappy. I see someone that's, that's looking to mix things up. You call your book WTF, not to be, you know, which right away punches you as it should be what the fuck, but it's not. Right. Um, and that's, I think, like the 1-800-GOT-JUNK. Um, it's, it's upside down, the colors that you use in your marketing, et cetera. So let's talk about how 1-800-GOT-JUNK started and um, why that's propelled you from there. Well, to, to start with, maybe just a quick story is, you know, you mentioned uh, about me growing up in England and, and San Francisco and Vancouver and all over the place. My family moved a lot. My dad's a liver transplant surgeon. And as he was studying in different places, we moved. I moved schools a lot, not just because of my dad. I also moved because I was scrappy, because I was a kid that couldn't pay attention, because I was getting in trouble and I was a disruptor, not in the entrepreneurial disruptor way, but I was a disruptor in class and I wasn't a great student. I went to 14 schools from kindergarten through to high school, through to college, moved around a lot. The only school I finished was kindergarten. That's the only diploma I have. And I don't say that to be funny. I say that as truth. Yeah. Um, I had trouble focusing, but it did make me who I am today. The failures, the challenges, the gifts. So if I look at where I am today and what I'm about, um, again, love watching people grow, love opportunities. Um, while I dropped out of school, I didn't drop out of learning. I love to learn, but I learn through conversations. I learn from people. I learn from uh, situations like this versus sitting down in a classroom and, uh, and, and trying to go through the motions of learning uh, on someone else's terms. I want to learn on my, on my own terms. Now, he here's the ADD kicking in because you asked me a question and I've already lost the question. <laughs> okay. The one eight hundred. How one eight hundred? Oh, yeah. How did that start? Started. Well, I was in a McDonald's drive-through, and there I was, one course short of graduation, yep. and wasn't going to make it through my twelfth grade diploma. And I said, "Okay, uh, how am I going to pay for college?" I talked my way into college without my last class in grade twelve, mm -hmm. and I needed to find a way to pay for it. And my parents weren't going to fund my education unless I would finished high school. And so I had to go a different path and I had to create my own business. So in this McDonald's, I see a beat up old pickup truck. It said Mark's hauling on the side of the truck. And I look at it and I go, that's my ticket. I had a thousand dollars in the bank, put 700 towards a pickup truck and uh, flyers and business cards with the remaining money. And off I went hauling junk. We were called the rubbish boys at the time. And it was a fun business to build learning about business on the streets versus studying in school. 
Now, while it did fund my college education, one year before I was done, I, I dropped out and I said, hey, dad, I sat my dad down and it wasn't a great conversation uh, because he said, what are you doing? You're, you're leaving school to become a full-time junk man? I said, yeah, this business opportunity won't always be here. School will be. I can always go back if I choose, but I got to strike while the iron's hot and grow this business. And so I dropped out. My dad thought I was nuts and uh, I added a second truck and I started growing. And today we're a $600 million business just in 1-800-GOT-JUNK, starting from a $700 investment. I think my dad's a fan now. I think he's on side with the decision to drop out. What, what, what does your mom think? <laughs> oh, yeah. My mom, my mom was less strict and concerned about the decision. She didn't care, I think, as much if I finished school. She knew I'd find my way and she had great intuition and yeah. she was fine. It was my dad, who, someone who... As a liver transplant surgeon, you do a lot of school over and over and over all these different certifications, which you want in a surgeon if you're on the other end of that operation. And my dad uh, just really wanted me to finish school, but it wasn't for me. So when you think about the 1-800-GOT-JUNK, so we, how did it, so you had, that's the idea and how you got it started, your second truck, but what's the magic? What is it in your view that it makes it work and grow? Yeah, it's a, a big question. I mean, people will say, wow, you've grown so quickly, 600 million. Look at this business. You're all over Canada, US, Australia. And my response is always these overnight success stories sure take a long time. I mean, 33 years, Anthony, like that's a long, a long time. And what's the magic? What's the secret sauce? I think it's a couple of things. I think the level of how we focus on branding our trucks are mobile billboards. We keep our trucks clean and shiny. We're in the junk removal business, but you never get a second chance to make a first impression. We are energetic and enthusiastic. We're smiley, happy people. Our, our secret sauce in finding people is hire happy people. One of the reasons I love Starbucks is no matter what Starbucks I go to on the planet, they're smiling. They know your name because you've written it on the cup, but they, they just deal with you in a real humanistic way. And we try and do the same thing with 1-800-GOT-JUNK. The thing we hear the most about our, our brand is people say, oh, you've got such great people. And it's true. And I think our secret strategic formula, not so secret, but our, our formula for growth, find the right people and treat them right. If we take care of our people, they will take care of the customer. If we take care of our customer, they'll take care of the growth of our profit, our opportunity, our brand, our reputation. And so we work very hard at keeping the consistency of great people doing great work. And it's a franchise model. So these great people, you empower them, as you talk about in your book, to build their own business. Because Absolutely. essentially, like you said, the individual in the call center could end up one day deciding that you want to expand to Toronto. They'll get in a truck. And how are we going to do it? We're just going to drive from Vancouver to Toronto and we're going to start. Yeah. I love I mean, that story. Yeah. Paul Guy, who is our first franchise owner, yep. great friend. And here's a guy who we actually had a bit of a, a scrap in the office, nothing physical, but we were, we were arguing and we were butting heads and I get along with everybody, but for whatever reason, my leadership at that young age in my twenties, late twenties, I wasn't able to be challenged by others. There's that mm -hmm. quote, if you're in the, you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. Um, I felt like I was the smartest person in the room and didn't want to listen to Paul. So we had a scuffle, a sort of disagreement. And uh, I decided, you know, he didn't need to be here anymore and wanted to fire the guy. And I let him go. And three days later, he's still in the office. He's still working and he didn't want to leave. And I had this idea because he was spending time with his girlfriend in Toronto, who's now his wife. And I said, you're making so many trips to Toronto. What do you think of starting the first franchise? And his eyes lit up. He smiled. We both smiled. And we've never had a disagreement since. And he became the first franchise owner. Uh, and he's built a business in Toronto that's leading the way for every other franchise in our system. They all look and they say, I want to be just like Paul. And it's been unbelievable. But again, someone who starts in the company at a lower level to then become an owner. And now Paul and his partners are inspiring owners all over. And people that get into... Uh, growing in different markets with our brands, franchising, as I, as you know, in, in BYOB, I talk about in the book, pick a path, 
Do you want to start with a blank sheet like I did, start a business from scratch, which was slower. It took me eight years to get to a million in revenue. Or do you pick a franchise? Do you follow someone else's playbook? Someone who comes from team sports understands this. Follow the rules, follow the plays. If you work hard, you're going to succeed. And that's what Paul Guy did. Paul did a million in his first calendar year. It took me eight years to get there. And Paul yeah. did it eight times faster because he had a playbook. Yeah. So when you, you know, because I, I know this, read about the story of uh, one day painting. Mm -hmm. And um, talk to us about why entrepreneurs fail. And mm -hmm. or that will spin into what, what will make them successful. I mean, Anthony, you, you have a lot of experience in business and entrepreneurship. I mean, we yeah. could spend all day talking about failure and not even skim the surface. You're right. Why do people fail? Let me talk about why I failed. I, you mentioned that there's a, a fourth business. Well, there actually isn't a fourth business any longer. It's you mentioned, go. You Move Me was our moving business. It's talked about in the first book. It went to print and the business was no longer. We got out after eight years. And it was, a, it was one of the biggest failures I've ever had. But it was an, an amazing gift because what it allowed Eric, our president, and myself to see was, why did it fail? Why did we sell it? And we sold it at break even, so we didn't lose money, but a lot of time and energy going into trying to grow a business that we just realized wasn't the right business for us. And, and here's why. When someone has junk removed, they go, oh, what a relief. When someone has wow one day painting, paint their home and done in a day, they walk home and they go, wow, transformation. Shack shine, we do windows, gutters, power washing. The moment you're able to look through your clean windows again, you feel like, wow, this is just amazing. With moving, no matter how great your movers are, at the end of the day, you're still stressed, right? You've got, you, you smiled immediately because you know the feeling. It's, oh my gosh, I still have to unpack, stuff's lost, stuff's broken, mom and dad are fighting, the kids don't like the new neighborhood, whatever. Moving is stressful. And we realized it wasn't a happy business. It's a necessary business. And thank goodness we've all used movers, but it's not an easy, happy business. We couldn't transform that feeling. And we decided to sell the business and get out of you, move me and pass it on to someone else and hope that they could do what we couldn't. So why do entrepreneurs fail? They make mistakes. They get in the wrong business. They aren't focused. They try and do multiple things at once. They're not well capitalized. I mean, we could go on and on and on. Um, but I would say as an entrepreneur, as someone who's going to embark on getting into business, be okay with failure. Just know that you will fail multiple, multiple times. You can take our greatest entrepreneurs in Canada that have ever lived, you know, pick one out on the West Coast, Jimmy Pattison, yep. billions and billions of dollars in what he's built. Ask that guy about failure. Ask him how many times he's failed and what it's made him. We have to fail. Yeah. And, and I, I, I love the quote you have, uh, to succeed without failing would be a hollow victory. Deep in your heart, you'll always know that you didn't earn it. I, I, can, you, can you imagine if we succeeded without failure? We'd, we'd feel like we didn't earn it. We'd feel like, okay, that was just too easy. The excitement for me, when I look back at my journey and still plenty of journey ahead of me and plenty more mistakes I'll make, it isn't the crossing the finish line that's the proudest moment. It's the how we overcame the troubles, the challenges, and, and how we still stuck true to our values to say, you know, at times when we had to fire people, we still gave them their dignity. We still did it in the right way. We treated them like people. And those are the things that, that matter. It's not the finish line. It's the, it's the journey. Love it. Um, so let's now just look at um, your, your marketing, right? And I see that uh, the titles of your businesses or the names of your businesses, the colors you choose, mm -hmm. it's, th there is a theme here. And I think it's important to how you built your businesses. So maybe you could tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, you know, why fit in when you were born to stand out? I think that was a uh, Dr. Seuss quote. We just love having our brands show up in a way that fits our personality, having fun. We take ourselves seriously, but um, or we take, sorry, the businesses seriously, but not ourselves too much. You know, if you look at my background here, I'm in a little snow cabin. I've got, you know, a bunch of quotes on my hat. You know, it's all about people. 
it's kind of fun to do the impossible. We, we do things and we show up in a, a louder, fun, prouder way. And our brands, people connect with them. People buy um, brands that they love that they can connect with. You know, is Starbucks any better in terms of coffee than your neighborhood local barista? I don't know, maybe not. But I love the way they show up consistently as a brand. And people buy brands. I search out a Starbucks nearby. You know, some people would search out a Tim Hortons, whatever it might be. We buy brands because of how they make us feel. And, and uh, you know, I've had marketing experts tell, talk to me about when you're marketing, you have to appeal to that, to emotion. Mm-hmm. And um, the, the, the colors of got junk, 1-800-GOT-JUNK, it, it, it sparks some kind of emotion. Well, I got junk. Yeah, I got junk. What do yeah. I do? Yeah. Um, what's the magic of, of what, how, uh, you know, the 1-800-JUNK business works? You call, you make the phone call. I got this, you know, this junk, if you will. And I want you to take it away. But how do you actually make money? Is it taking away the junk or is there more to it? No, it's it's charging to take away the junk. It's as easy as that. It is making it easy for our customers. So someone goes online to 1-800-GOT-JUNK.COM. They've got a couch or maybe they've got a whole reno that they're doing and they've got a bunch of basement junk they're getting rid of. But they book an online order. We come by in as, as little as 90 minutes and we haul away their junk. We sweep up and couple of smiley, friendly faces, thank them, and off we go. The magic is we are building brands by making a job easy for our people and easy for the customer. Uh, We charge for our service. It's not inexpensive. Junk removal is one of these services where sometimes people are like, what? It's just junk. How can you charge me, you know, hundreds of dollars a truckload, whatever it might be based on what they've got. And we pay disposal fees. You know, the world is trying to, thankfully, from an environmental perspective, stop everything going in the ground and trying to recycle and reduce waste. Uh, So it does get a little expensive, but it's a service that's needed. And uh, it's interesting. There was an article in the Globe and Mail this past weekend talking about the great purge and that we've got all these baby boomers who are now going to downsize and they've got a lifetime worth of junk that they're going to have to get rid of. Where does that go? people don't want this stuff anymore. And yes, we can try and recycle 66, sorry, 61.6% of what we remove gets recycled, uh, donated and and so on. But we're not making money off of that. We're making money from charging a fee for carting it away from someone's home to a recycling depot transfer station or worst case, a landfill. I I thought you might be able to resell some of the stuff, package it and and, and actually get, uh, sell it. That's not, that's not something that's part of the business? It's rare. It's rare. So we're not getting rid of collectibles. You talked about, you know, you were in the hockey card business as a serial entrepreneur. So was yeah. I during college. We're not getting rid of collectibles and stuff that is worth money. You know, you might get someone with a bike that they're throwing out that you might be able to put on Craigslist. But we'll say to our customers, don't have us cart it away for a fee if you can sell it to someone. And sometimes people say it's not worth the time. So occasionally we'll get some good finds. You might get someone on the truck that goes, oh, great, I got a new bike. But it's okay. rare. It's usually junk and it's got nowhere to go but get recycled or disposed of. Got it. So a bit off topic. How about I'm sure you're watching the stock market volatility. Um, I wonder um, what op- interesting opportunities do you see out there in the marketplace today? If you're going to start another business, where, where are you thinking about now? Yeah, so it's interesting. When you say I'm watching the stock market volatility, I'm, I'm not a news guy. I'm not an investor outside of my own businesses. So while I do hear from everyone that the stock market's going crazy and things keep tumbling and it's on you know, its worst run since the 20s or whatever it might be, um, I, don't, I don't follow the markets. I'm not in the markets, but I see that there's always opportunity. Things will always go up and they'll always go down. I, I love the Warren Buffett, you know, buy when people are fearful, um, sell when everyone's buying. And it's, I think it's like that in business. Find an opportunity where someone is not doing something the way it needs to be done. How can you do better? So junk removal, as an example, was, it was a way to pay for college, but I realized that this is a brand that, or this is a business that we could build a brand and grow in because everybody's got junk. There's no national brand. We created the first. 
Um, you look at wow, one day painting. We go into people's homes and we paint their home in a day. Now people are like, oh, the quality is going to be terrible. No, are you kidding me? Everyone knows you can paint one room with one person in a day or a bigger room. You might need two people. All we do is we put the right number of people in the right number of rooms. So if you've got 16 people properly prepped and coordinated throughout a paint job and you get that home done in a day, the quality is as good or better because you've actually got a, a dedicated quality assurance person that is one of the painters who walks around to inspect what they expect to make sure the job was amazing. And we get it done in a day instead of someone moving into your home for a couple of weeks while they're painting, you've got this thing done quicker. So in looking for a business, what is a niche? What is an opportunity to do something different to make an industry better? Painting someone's home in a day is better than doing it in two weeks. No one can argue that. Right on. And so are there specific opportunities that you see out there today? You know what? It's a good question. I'm so focused on our businesses that if I was to go start another business today, I think I'm a big believer, grow where you're planted. I'm planted in home services. Mm -hmm. I'd find another home service space to get into. And, and one day when we've got the ability and capacity to start more brands, we will. Uh, we may fail again. Who knows? But You Move Me would have been our fourth company. It's no longer with us, but we would find something else to get into that was a happy business. Um, there's plenty of things people need, lawn care, irrigation. Um, we even tag on some things to like Shack Shine. We do Christmas lights. Mm -hmm. We have guys going up and doing, or people going up and down ladders, doing gutters, doing mm -hmm. windows. Why not during the slow season, have them do Christmas lights. And that add-on has become a, a third of our entire revenue in Shack Shine. So we're building a, another hundred million dollar brand and so much of our business comes from just an idea that we didn't start with, but added on as Christmas lights. And, and would you say that all these ideas are more pull or push, if you understand what I'm, where I'm saying? In other words, the customers ask you, can you do this? Or yeah. do, you, do you go knock on the customer's door and say, hey, do you also want us to do Christmas lights? I think it's just a feedback loop from customers, from employees, from franchise owners, the idea for Christmas lights came from one of our owners. And so you never know where an idea will come from. And I think as a leader, your job is to listen and mm -hmm. say, wow, that is an interesting idea. That could be done differently. You take companies like Airbnb. I mean, they challenged and transformed an industry, yeah. the hotel world. You take Hilton or any other brand out there. Yeah. They thought Airbnb was a crazy idea. They thought it was stupid. But you know what? they were wrong. And you've now got Airbnb is so much bigger than Hilton because they didn't listen and open their eyes wide to an opportunity in front of them. There's so many stories of that Netflix with the, you know, blockbuster and, and sure. look at, look at the, you know, if you used to have a, a, a taxi license, uh, they used to laugh at Uber. Those taxi licenses are worth nothing. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's just incredible. If well, someone has a, Go ahead. Sorry. Oh, no, I was going to say, and, and Kodak, one of my favorites is Kodak oh, yeah. invented the digital camera. Yes. They invented it. And they went out of business. Yeah. Because they did nothing with it. They thought it was cute. If anyone has a question for Brian, please just hover uh, to the bottom of your screen. Um, you'll see their uh, Q&A symbol. And then I'll look down here at my little trusty phone. And, um, and we'll be able to uh, ask Brian a specific question if in case you might have one. I'm going to just launch here our, um, rate our poll so that everyone can tell us what a great job you've done. Uh -huh, All right. And give us ideas for our next, our next show. Actually, Jimmy Patterson, I've reached out to him and um, his, uh, his people, as it were, are looking to schedule something. So I'm... Uh, you know, reaching out here to uh, to uh, Jimmy that we'll give him a plug here. I'd love to have him on as well. Yeah, um, tell, him I, tell him I say hello. He is uh, someone I got the privilege to meet who is an incredible Canadian success story. And here's a guy who's seen opportunity where others have not. Yeah. The grocery business, the car business, places that you just go, ah, who wants to be in that space? And he's just lit it up. So kudos to Jimmy. And he's always got his head up. The thing is, you've got to have your head up looking for opportunities. You always and you have to. And, and I can see in you, there's a lot of humility here. Um, I see a lot of people uh, failing in business. 
because they're just not humble. They're not willing to admit that, hey, I might be wrong. Like, yeah, just because it, it worked last time like this, if this time it doesn't work, that means I got to adapt. I have to change. Um, tell us, uh, I always like to ask everybody your, your favorite book. Probably the E Myth, the E Myth Revisited by Michael Gerber. It's yeah. all about how to build and scale your business through systems and systems being checklists and just a framework for how to really ensure greatness in your business at every single step. So think McDonald's. You can take someone that has very little training, plug them into the McDonald's system, and they can be successful. It's the same thing with our franchise businesses. We take someone who might not have ever been schooled in business. We teach them how to write, run a great business. We give them a playbook and off they go to be successful. Perfect. So everything's got a system. That is a really good book. Um, favorite podcast you might listen to? Favorite podcast? Uh, I think hands down How I Built This with Guy Raz. It is one of the top podcast out there. We've been fortunate enough to be on there in the early days. I mean, we had to push hard to sell Guy on the idea of telling our story, but this guy has become world famous. Uh, he used to be an NPR journalist, and he's interviewed just about every CEO you can ever imagine. And just one of the most incredible storytellers I've, I've ever met. Great. And uh, favorite Twitter handle or other social media handle that you might follow? Yeah, so I'm I'm not a social media person. Now, while my brands, myself, were on social media, uh, I don't do a ton of interaction myself on social media. I find as an ADD personality, it's too distracting and it's easy to get sucked into a thread and a hole. Uh, for me personally, it would be LinkedIn because it's the business social medium. Uh, that would be my favorite. So anytime I am spending, I'm there versus uh, versus anywhere else. Who do I follow? Who do I love? Um, Jason Pfeiffer, who is a, he's the chief uh, editor in chief of Entrepreneur Magazine. Love the way that guy thinks. And he's just got an interesting brain. He's super smart and a little quirky and fun. And yeah, he came to speak at our conference for our brands uh, this past February. Great guy. So one of my, uh, one of my uh, partners this morning, we have our meeting and, and, uh, asked, you know, what question I, sh I should ask you. Is there anything that, you know, that you wish you would have done differently at this point, uh, if you look at your at your career? Well, it's a great question. And you can tell your partner, it's one that I get asked a lot. And, uh, oh. <laughs> and, I've, ref and I've reflected on, um, I wouldn't change a thing. I, I really would never have changed a thing. Because I can look back and go, oh, our moving business, what a pain. It was so hard. It was so much negative energy and it was a slog, but we needed to learn mm -hmm. and it taught us valuable things that have made us better. And so you can look at yourself in, in anything in life. I don't know. I, I love skiing and sometimes we fall and sometimes we get hurt, but you needed that to improve, to get better, to, uh, to take a risk, to avoid a future failure. And so would I have changed anything? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. I, um, I think as long as someone has their values intact and they do it the right way um, and you can feel good about it and sleep at night, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have changed a thing. Super proud of what we're building and how we've built it and, and even the mistakes we've made along the way. Good. One other question, um, because your, your business, as you mentioned many times in our discussion today, is based on people. Mm -hmm. uh, finding the right people and empowering them to do great things right and you know all the entrepreneurs here listening and anyone that's that's managing people knows how difficult it is to find the right people mm -hmm. so do you have a checklist perhaps that you follow or or uh advice that you'd give on on finding the right people yeah so it's interesting as a very systematized uh business and a systematized personality that i have it helps with my add is we've really tried to simplify the hiring process and we call it the beer and barbecue test. I find when you're interviewing someone for a job or someone is getting interviewed, they're getting asked all sorts of theoretical questions. You don't know if they're being honest or not with their answers. They're nervous. And we tried to narrow it down to a very simple process. Would you have a beer with this person? 
Mm-hmm. So Anthony, if you and I were at some bar in Toronto getting to know each other, you know, we would just be like this chatting, ha- asking yeah. each other some questions and oh, tell me about your hockey card business when you were a kid and paper routes and all that sort of stuff. We try and get to know someone. And at the end of the interview, it's would we have a beer with them? Are they interesting? Are they interested? Do you have a shared passion and goal in life? And then the barbecue test is what would they be like at a company barbecue, at a company picnic? Would they fit in? Would they add to the culture? We're not looking for everyone to be just like us by any means, quite the opposite. We want diversity. We want challenging opinions. We want different personalities. But does it, is it like a good house party where it just fits and it works? And so the beer and barbecue test, we, we interview a lot. Um, somebody goes through plenty of interviews to be a part of O2E Brands, but we simplify it and just ask ourselves. And, and people do that at the end. They're like, so would I have a beer with this person? And uh, if the answer is yes, that's, that's good news. We hire an attitude, train on skill. Now, if we're looking for a CFO, as we have done in the past, you want someone with great financial acumen and the proper training, but that's where we go to KPMG, our auditors, and say, can you interview them on the skill? We're going to interview on the culture side and on the fit and the ad to the business. Right. Excellent advice. Excellent advice. Um, Brian, uh, anything you'd like to, to leave us with today uh, before I let you go? I mean, if I can ever help anyone, uh, I love people, as you can tell. And so reach out and connect with me on LinkedIn, social media. And uh, if you got any questions that you know weren't able to ask today, or maybe someone's listening to this feed not live, and they have a question, fire it off to me and happy to weigh in with uh, any thoughts that I, that I might have from my experience. Very good. Brian, uh, continued success. Do you think you might take your company private, uh, public one day? You know what? Absolutely not. I, uh, I love the private world. Uh, nothing against companies that go public other than I want to control the vision. And we've got a great team of people. And by keeping it private, we don't, we don't need the money to grow publicly because we are a franchise organization and we're using other people's money uh, to grow that way. Uh, that's been our form of financing. So I, I think the answer is no. Well done. Keep it up. Great success awesome. story. All the best. Thank you, Anthony. All right. Cheers. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you on the next show.